magical afternoon where we are going to learn how to create value, create value from the earth, tap into the earth. We're going to kick off with practical fodder solutions from Nick Ferguson. Now, I know you guys know who Nick Ferguson is. How, how many people have listened to his podcast, Homegrown Liberty? How many of you loved that podcast? Really well done podcast. One of my favorites. We were sad when he stopped after a year, but I fully support you stopping after a year because you have a lot more to offer in person as a teacher. He is, he travels all over the country doing permaculture um, consults. And when I asked him to give me a fact about him that nobody knew, um, <laughs> he told me he was handsome, which means people must tell him he's ugly all the time. But the real thing that came to mind was this. Courtesy of David. He's a wizard. Uh huh. And this is the real reason you couldn't change your slides. <laughs> nice. Nick, come on up. <laughs> Where did you get the picture of my torso? It's weird. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, Everyone having a good weekend so far? Yeah. I love it coming to these events. I hope you're having a good time. We're going to talk about practical fodder solutions today. I know y'all have heard me talk about fodder trees for years now. Some of y'all were here last year, so you saw a presentation on fodder trees. Some of these slides are going to be the same, but we have a bunch of new faces. And I am expanding out what we were talking about last year a bit and showing you some cool different solutions. Okay, um, so one of the things that I really, really try and focus on when I'm doing a consult is um, we always try and design into the system that we're building something that's going to work if times get tough or even if they don't. I don't know if you've ever heard that. It's it's a good slogan. Um, yeah, it's a little long, but it's good. Um, so so if if we design something that is so resilient that you know no matter what happens, what global catastrophe, EMP, CME, whatever, and nothing electrical works, we design it to work like that. We've designed basically an Amish existence. So if that doesn't work, if times are great, that's not a really good solution. So I want something that's robust that we can pivot to if something terrible goes wrong, but also is abundant and works fantastic if times are great. If we have access to electrical, mechanical, um, amazing machines that do a lot of work for us, I want to capitalize on that every opportunity that I can. So I want to make sure we're designing something that works if times are good or bad. So <clears throat> it, it kind of brings up this dilemma. If times are good, man, we, we oftentimes just use the easy button. We go to the feed store. We buy bags of concentrated feed. It's got who knows what, what in it. Um, I don't know how many of y'all might have had chickens the past year or so, and you had the weird they stopped laying thing. <laughs> Uh, going on and if you switched your feed to something more whole in nature like whole wheat or whole corn all of a sudden they started laying again i don't know what's going on but um there's there's a there's a drawback to that using that easy button but it's cheap it's convenient it works um so i'm not saying don't ever use the easy button but we also want to make sure we are not designing a system that is 100% beholden to that easy button feed source being there forever. So if times were to get tough, things get a little bit more expensive, don't they? Um, so you have to cut down your flock or your herd if times are getting tough and things are getting expensive, um, which means your profits go down and prices go up. And man, if it's really bad, then, man, you don't have animals to feed. You don't have food to put in your family's belly. That's a sad life. So, <clears throat> did that do too? Yeah. So the better way, there is a better way to do this, right? If during 
a relative time of plenty, when things are going well, we start transitioning things to a more sustainable practice. We start putting in forest fodder trees. We start planting, my boys called it there, the fodder forest. Uh, used to be all overgrown and these weeds just laying over top of each other and they'd kind of make uh, make passages through it. They called it the forest of fear. Well, when we cleaned it all up and changed it, they called it the, for the fodder forest. So we can also implement insects into this. I'm not going to get into insects. We talked about it a little bit yesterday when we we're doing the tour, but we can feed these fodder trees to insects, high protein, leaf content. We can turn that into insect feed. That means we can feed our omnivore birds. So we can feed all of our herbivores and our omnivore birds. And the foundation starts with the fodder trees. Um, I'm just going to kind of skip through this a little bit. We've got the hammer mill and pelletizer that we can uh, talk about a little bit later. And, you know, when times are good, we can still supplement with feed store stuff. I still buy rabbit pellets, even though I have fodder trees. Um, if times were to get tough and you are growing your own feed, this is an exponential increase in profit because everyone else's feed is going through the roof and yours is getting cheaper and cheaper because your system is maturing and being more productive. So that means your profit margin is going up while everyone else's profit margin is going down. That is an amazing, amazing situation to be in if times are getting tough. That lets you expand your business. You've heard that wise people get rich in recessions and depressions. It's because they look for opportunities like this. Um, so we're going to start planting fodder trees. When was the best time to plant a tree? Yesterday. Yeah. The second best time is today. So the foundation of all of this that we're talking about, um, the, the king of fodder trees, in my opinion, is white mulberry. They grow from Canada to the tip of Florida the whole continental US. They'll even grow up in Alaska in parts. Uh, next on my list would be hybrid willow. And I have recently flip-flopped lace bark elm over hybrid poplar. I still like hybrid poplar. It is more of a fuel wood. It's excellent at that. Um, but I like the lace bark elm a little bit better. So we're gonna skip over the insect production stuff since we're focusing on Fodder trees. I want to show you this flow chart real quick. Um, I want people to kind of get in their mind a... We, we talk about stacking functions, right? Um, the more resources that we can keep within our sphere of control, our sphere of influence, you know, that Stephen Covey habits of successful people thing. Don't worry about the things that are outside of your sphere of influence, your sphere of control. Um, the more we can keep our dollars, which are a unit of energy, it's our time, it's our caloric expenditure, we have a finite amount of that stuff. The more we send those dollars outside of our control, the more poor we get. The more we keep them inside of our control and make those dollars recycle within our sphere of control, the more we build wealth. And wealth is just a measure of how many days you don't have to do what other people tell you you have to do. It's how long you can do what you want to do. It's how long you can feed your family and keep them healthy and um, happy. So it all starts with fruit and fodder trees. Um, we've got yields over here. We've got food, we've got profit, we've got resources, fertility. These trees will produce leaves and that is feed for something like rabbits. You can put sheep, goats, cows, any herbivore in this slot right here. And we're gonna get meat, we can, we can get pets, we're gonna always get manure because you put stuff in, stuff's gonna come out. Most people will actually pay to get rid of that stuff. We want to make that stuff back into something that puts more dollars in our pocket. We want more profit. We want more stuff within our control. So we're going to use this to our, the best of our ability. We can put it in earthworm bins. We can put in black soldier fly larva bins. We can put it straight into compost bins. We 
the more we can con keep this contained and not export it off of our property, the more wealth we'll build. So a lot of people will buy the feed to feed the animals and they'll pay to have the manure hauled off. Like I'm paying double to lose my money. That's insane. So let's let's pay once and get this stuff growing and then let let these trees do the work for us. Some people say I'm I'm a lazy homesteader. I like animals doing the work for me. I like trees doing the work for me. What? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um <clears throat> so we've got our earthworm bin, our black soldier fly larva bin. We can sell we can take a profit by selling bait. I don't know how many of y'all have looked for earthworms uh, and earthworm packages during the years. I have not seen one year where the major suppliers don't sell out. They sell out all the time. I've, I've never ever seen it. So there is an untapped market. There's always a way to sell earthworms. Um, castings are one of the most amazing things for fertility. Everyone talks about uh, rabbit manure being, you know, black gold or whatever. Um, goat manure, sheep manure is amazing. They are. You know what I'd rather have? I'd rather, instead of messing with this manure, touching it, handling it, scooping it, expending my energy and effort, I'd rather just drop it directly out of those rabbits into the worm bin and let the earthworms do my work for me. And then all I have to do is just collect the product. And then I can take that worm tea. I can directly drop that liquid into a vessel with an aeration stone so it stays aerobically active so it doesn't go stagnant and produce some nasty stuff. I can drop that liquid directly in there, keep it aerated. And then every time my irrigation controller automatically tells it to turn on and water my fruit trees, my fodder trees, my garden, whatever, it's automatically taking that fertility and putting it where I need it. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to mess with it. It automatically happens. And then we get to take a profit. I'm losing some of my lines here. Um, and everything comes back to this chicken compost yard. Again, I'm making the animals do the, the work for me. I don't want to make compost. I want animals to make compost for me. Like I said, I'm lazy. Is it lazy or smart? I don't know. Um, everything that we don't eat Everything that can turn into dirt that I purchase, you know where it goes? It goes here. That everyone says, well, what about, what about, and what about? I keep answering, can it turn into dirt? Well, what about, you know, paper towels? Can it turn into dirt? Yes. But the chickens aren't going to, I don't care. I don't care if the chickens will eat it. That's not the question. The question is, will it turn into dirt? Well, can I feed chickens chicken bones and meat? Can it turn into dirt? Yes. You put it in there. Yeah. Can, yeah. can it turn into dirt? There you go. So everything that can turn into dirt goes in here because everything that I purchase that can turn into dirt, I do not want to export it and pay to have it dumped in a landfill. That was a little bit of money. It may be a little fraction, but every single little bit of it I can hang on to is that much less. I have to go earn and pay taxes on and then pay sales tax on and then pay tax on the fuel to transport it. Everything I get to keep. All that compost, gets recycled to the whole system. The compost goes to the garden and it goes to my fruit and fodder trees and it keeps recycling and recycling. So now that you have a picture of this, we're going to get more into the fodder trees. Hang on to your questions until the end um, because I find a lot of times the question gets answered by the next slide. It might, might not. Um, what does it look like? What does it look like? What do these systems look like? People ask, what is a fodder tree? I'm just going to show you. Here's my three boys. Here are some freshly planted trees. These are, I don't know, uh, probably a month or two old. Um, they got planted um, in April of, I think, the year before last. So they grow really fast. This is about five foot tall already. Here's my oldest standing next to those same trees. 
the same trees exactly a year later. So this was shot in June and we planted in April. So exactly a year later, look at those jokers. He didn't stay the same height, by the way. Um, he grew too. So these at this point are probably about 12 feet tall. Um, those are the, the willows. They're out of the frame. Those willows were about 16 feet tall one year later. They had been in the ground one year and like two months. So this is how we planted them. We planted them about every six to eight inches. Now, we're going to get into this a little bit later. Oh, that's how I planted them. No, no, no. That's how I planted them because my goal was to cram as many things into this space as I possibly could because I'm taking cuttings and selling them to people. So I wanted as many cuttings as I could possibly fit in here. You can do this, certainly. Um, it may not be the best thing for you. Um, this is what the space looks like in between. We solarized this. When you hear me talking about solarizing, this was clear plastic that did that. It killed everything. It killed all the weed seeds. It was wonderful. It gives me a clean slate that I can seed onto, I can plant into, and I can put whatever I want to uh, in that space in between them. So there's the solarized area or one that just got done or I can't remember. But I wanted to show you here's like three foot tall trees and then here is 16 foot tall trees exactly one year later. This is what these systems look like. This is um, just a few days before I came up here to this workshop. These trees, this right here is nine feet tall. That's a 10 foot T post and it's in the ground about a foot. I just had a sprinkler head stuck on the top of it so it could shoot over top of the trees. Now, this is not what your fodder systems will look like. This is what mine looked like because I was gone all summer consulting. I was gone all over the place. Um, so typically, we will cut them at about 18 to 20, 24 inches tall, and then we'll let them grow, and then we'll harvest and let them grow, and then we'll harvest. So we keep them cut short, okay? But this is how tall they can grow. People ask, well, you know, can I use this for like a windbreak or or a visual screen? Absolutely. That's what they'll look like. This is beavers doing coppicing in nature. They do that all the time. This is a tree they cut down and and it just regrows. And then they come and they harvest. Yep, they're farming these trees. And then they'll let it regrow and it'll get about six foot tall and then they'll go and just snip everything off and then it heals over and it regrows and they get to harvest the leaves and the cambium because that's what they eat. This is not new technology. These are some low pollards. Again, I'm just kind of giving you some quick imagery so you can have a concept in your mind. A pollard is going to be cut a little bit higher. And there are several reasons. We'll get into that. But this is a pollard. Here are some pollarded trees, and these are quite old. This is probably about four foot in diameter, three foot or so. These are some quite old trees. Look at them off in the distance. These have been pollarded for a long time. So why would you coppice? OK, I prefer to coppice trees. Um, the main reason is the management of these trees is far simpler, safer, easier, and cheaper when you coppice them. It is far more dangerous and costly and difficult to work overhead. If you have to get up on a ladder, more people get injured by ladder falls than you could possibly imagine every year. So um, I think it looks good. I mean, how, how nice would it be if once a year you talk to a neighbor or someone in your community who has a tractor with a bush hog and you can just say, hey, can you come over? I'll give you 50 bucks, 100 bucks or whatever. Just straddle this row of trees and mow it over. And then if you need to, you can go clean some stuff up. And in 30 minutes, all of your, all of your fodder trees are reset to zero once a year. It's really easy to clean up. I didn't know what coppice was since I've been here before. There may be somebody in the room. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're getting into that. 
Um, so the yearly workflow. If we are coppicing, what we're going to do is we're going to take those trees and we're going to cut them down to the ground, flush with the ground, a couple of inches above the ground. We cut them all the way to the ground every winter when they're dormant. The reason why we want, we want to do that is it will heal over and it will send out new shoots and we'll have this very, um, very resilient and long lived stump that will keep producing um, high protein, high sugar, um, cambium rich and leaf rich shoots. That's what we're looking for. So every year we're going to re we're going to prune it to our winter reset. If it's a pollard, we're going to cut it up high, right? So pollarding is just cutting up high. And generally the reason why we would pollard is to get above the browse height of any herbivores. Cause guys, this is candy. For these animals deer love it cows love it sheep goats will go bonkers for it so the reason why we would pollard would be to get above that browse height so that those shoots are protected from the herbivores again it's not nearly as productive it's not nearly as stable or as easy or as safe to harvest them when they're pollarded but if you're restricted on space and you absolutely must integrate the the animals and the fodder trees then you would pollard so pollarding is for animal included, animal uh, inclusive designs, and coppicing is for animal excluded. No, you should not be letting your animals into your coppice trees to just harvest the leaves for you because they're going to strip all the leaves off from down low, and then they're going to leave all the leaves off uh, above where they can reach, and that's the opposite. That's the inversion of what you're looking for. You want to treat it like a lawn. You want to take the tops off and let it regrow and make sugars from the bottom leaves. And you keep, you just rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And then um, every winter, or sometimes in the summer, if it's white mulberry, you're gonna take some cuttings off of it to make more. So if you have white mulberry, you're gonna take cuttings in the summer and you're gonna put them under mist. It's a lot more complicated. Um, and that's how you propagate the white mulberry. If you have the hybrid poplar or, um, the hybrid willow, then you can take those cuttings just about any time. The best time times are in the summer, the same time as the white mulberry and in the winter. And the nice thing about the winter cuttings is this is how simple it is. Don't try and get complicated on me. You take a stick off of first year wood. If we're coppicing, everything that regrows is first year wood. You take a stick, and you jab it in the ground and you leave it alone. All right, I'm, we're going to go right back. You take a stick and you jab it in the ground and you leave it alone. I like pencil size diameter or larger. It can be four inches in diameter. It can be eight inches in diameter. You can actually cut these jokers eight inch post, eight foot tall, auger hole in the ground, drop the joker in, tamp it just like you would a fence post. You know what it's going to do? It's going to grow a new tree right there. Okay. So that's what happens every winter. That's our reset. And then during the summer is when we manage. We fertilize, we mulch, and we protect them. Because remember, this stuff is green gold. This stuff is candy for anything that eats leaves. So you got to protect it. And we harvest. So our first cut, like I said, we're going to cut about 18 to 24 inches high. Why? It's going to actually change depending on how tall you are. Because I want to work at an easy Elevation. I don't want to be working like this, and I don't want to be doing this all the time. You want to just set it low for your first cut, a little bit low, and then the next cut is just comfortable. Okay. And what you're going to do is you're going to treat it like a lawn. Think about a lawn. Do we go out there with our lawn mower and drop it down to zero? Nope. If we scalp the lawn, we kill the lawn, right? We want to leave a good four inches of leaves sticking up. Why? Because we want those leaves to keep making sugars to regrow more leaves, right? Exactly the same thing with the fodder trees. So think of it like a lawn. I'm going to show you some pictures a little bit later that looks like a lawn. It's a lawn of bushes in tea production. We can do the exact same thing with these white mulberries and willows. <clears throat> so our first cut is going to be about that height if we're managing it by hand like I am. Second cut 
is going to be just a little bit higher because you want to leave the healed over material so that it can make a whole bunch of new shoots. We don't want to keep taking that off lower and lower because then we make the plants make new. Um... Yeah, it's 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 the the cambium kind of makes this gnarly looking thing. If you ever see a pruned cut, kind of looks like a knob. That is full of the plant stem cells that can make a whole bunch of shoots and leaves and stuff. So we want to leave that on there so we're advantaging the plant to make more leaves and shoots. And then we're going to keep taking cuts as often as we need to. You can let it get four inches tall and take another cut. You can let it get four feet tall and take another cut. I like, I, you know, I'd encourage you to kind of shoot for about a foot to 18 inches of growth because then it's all going to be really succulent and you cut that stuff and it's all edible. The stems, the leaves, everything is edible at that kind of stage. And you can keep doing that as often as you can. So you might get three, four, five, six cuts in a year. It depends on your growing season, how well the ground is fertilized, and how much water. I can't tell you how many cuts or how much volume. It's going to depend on how old the trees are and all their environmental conditions. And at the end of the season, when fall is coming on, you want to stop doing that. Let it keep growing and let it pull all of those nutrients down into its roots for the winter because you're going to cut it, right? And we want it to have a whole bunch of stored up energy in the root crown and in the roots so that it can build a whole bunch of shoots and jump up there really fast in the spring. This is what you can expect out of a hybrid willow that's been taken care of well. This is at uh, this is uh, its second year in the ground. So this is like a year and three months or so from one of my clients. We planted hybrid willow and she watered it and she fed it. And we set up a little nursery close to the house. Like I always recommend you take care of them close to the house and you propagate from those. And man, it's amazing how quick they grow. This is one that's been cut. Here's how big it was at the end of its first year when she cut it. The other one was not cut. And it was just allowed to grow. So it was about that big the first year, and then it put on about double the second year. You can see how many shoots. Each one of these shoots is just about as big as this one. This is about 10 times as much growth. Now, let's go back. This is about double to triple, maybe quadruple. This is about 10 times as much. It's growing more when we coppice it. It's sending up more of these little branches. We get more cambium. More cambium is more protein, more sugar. That's what we're shooting for. And this is just a little bit more close-up view. All right. Uh-oh. Spacing. Um, we're <laughs> that looked fine earlier. So, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so the spacing. Um, it's situationally dependent. It, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. For me, like I said earlier, don't do what I did unless you're trying to just propagate a whole bunch and you are limited on space. I had, this is all enclosed in deer fence so I can protect them. And I needed to fit as many in there as I possibly could. And I plan on as they mature and get bigger, some of them are going to die or just be taken out. And that's totally fine. I'm totally fine with losing... Uh, my investment on one of those trees because the whole system is getting more productive as time goes on. So I spaced them about every six inches to give me a few years of harvest before I needed to start thinning. I like to shoot for between every two to four feet in spacing for end spacing on these fodder trees. So that's what I'd encourage you to do is plant them every foot to every two feet and then you might thin as time goes on to eventually end up with somewhere between two and four feet for your eventual spacing. And uh, you know, if you're if you're m much more of a a forest type ecosystem that you're going for, then you might split you know spread them out a whole lot more. It's just whatever works for you. Um, so when do we plant trees? That's another common question. When do I plant these? So if it's bare root. Bare root trees, you always plant in late winter because that's when they dig them and that's when they ship them. Um, if we're growing things from seed, so if you're going the, the cheaper, slower route and we're buying some seed or we're harvesting some 
some white mulberry seed, then you're going to cold stratify that over the winter. And then you're going to plant that seed in the spring and it's going to grow for a whole year in a nursery because we want to advantage them as much as we can. And then you're going to take those little seedlings out when they're dormant because they're bare roots and you're going to transplant them where they're going to eventually grow for you and produce. So seed goes in the spring. And if you're doing potted trees, if you buy something potted, even if it's a fodder type tree, you're going to open that up, open the roots up, plant it well in the fall fall to early winter. Um, another thing you can do with seed is you can actually plant it, broadcast it, plant it in rows in the fall and let nature do its own thing. But you're, you're going to have much less production than if you went straight into a nursery setting with your seed. So harvest and preparation. Our feeding methodology, we can, we can carry this stuff fresh. We can cut it and carry it fresh and feed it directly to the animals. Most of them love it, absolutely go bonkers over it fresh because it's full of sugars. Um, we can dry it immediately as tree hay. So we can cut the stuff, take it to the shade, lay it out and let it dry, and we can bundle it up and store it as tree hay. We can take that fresh cut stuff and we can shred it and put it into an anaerobic condition sometimes with a little bit of sugar to feed the lactobacillus, and we can ferment it basically as silage. So I don't know if you have heard of corn silage. It's old tech. People have been doing it for a long, long, long time. Um, we can actually make silage out of these, and we can store it for years. So you can harvest a whole bunch in the summer when there's an abundance, and we can ferment it as silage. And we can hold it over for times when it's not so plenteous, like the winter. Or if we have a summer, uh, a year without a summer, you know, that's happened before. Could happen again. Um, and we can dry that material and we can put it through a hammer mill and pelletizer and compact it and put it through a pellet machine and we can store those pellets. So lots of things we can do. Cut and carried fresh. Um, here's some pigs that are just chowing down on white mulberry. They absolutely love it. I was just up at Mark Baker's, uh, Baker's Green Acres in Marion, Michigan, I think, uh, earlier this year. And um, and I harvested some, uh, some mulberry. And about nine days later, um, I asked my wife to go snap a picture. And they got cut down here, and they grew about nine inches in nine days. Um, that's pretty darn cool. Um, oh, man, this is just hard to see. Um, so this guy has a gas-powered hedge trimmer, and the back side of it, there's basically a catch bin, and he's harvesting green tea leaves. So he's got this hedge trimmer and he's got on the back side of it, he's got this metal kind of catch basin. So as he cuts through it, it catches all the leaves and then he just lets go of the trigger and dumps it in this, this wheelbarrow right here. And so they just walk along and this, they just cut, drop, cut, drop. You've seen the scythes with a, a catch basket on it and, and they're harvesting grain. So they, they pull through and they cut. And then when they get to the end of their cut, they pull back, and a, a, an unbound sheave of grain just drops to the ground. You pick that up, and you tie it, and you got a sheave of grain. Same kind of concept here. Again, it looks better on the computer, but we've got the little cutter bar right here, just like a hedge trimmer. And then we have the, the basket. Here is it's so bright. Um, here is the... Uh, 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 this is a Chinese, basically a straddle harvester. And if it was a little bit darker in here, you could see there is, a, it's passing right over top of these fields of tea bushes. And they just straddle the row of bushes and it harvests it and it vacuums it up into these bins with the blower. So they're just driving along, straddling this stuff. You know, I hear all the time, this isn't scalable. You can't do this commercially. Well, not with that attitude, you won't. <laughs> So look, they're doing it. They harvest these leaves and they go in these big bins. Now, 
they're they're being really picky about this stuff and keeping it clean because they don't want to do a lot of cleanup with this stuff. They want to harvest it clean and then uh, sell it, dry it, um, process it into whatever they do with the tea. So look, this is what it looks like behind. This is a little bit easier to see. So we've got these big wide bushes with tracks and we're harvesting just a, like two inches of material off here. We can do this exact same thing. So if you're talking about, yeah, I've got, you know, 500 head of cattle. How can I make something like this? Doable. Like this. Man, this thing is sensitive. Um, we can take something like this on a tractor, right? So we've got a sickle bar mower. So I want you to think about scaling this down to a homestead size level. What if I had a little lawn tractor and I had a little battery powered or gas powered hedge trimmer? And I just, I don't know if you've ever seen those. Uh, uh, they've got a chainsaw and they've got a little trigger bar and you take a, a chunk of wood and you drop it over top of that and it hits the trigger bar and it pushes the trigger on the chainsaw and it <clears throat> revs it up. And by the time that log hits the bar, it's cutting a chunk of wood off for you. What if you had a little lawnmower and you just had a little trigger bar and it activated your, uh, your battery powered hedge trimmer and attached to this, this bar was some rigid plastic that was flexible enough to drop all this material into a little skid or trailer right behind your little lawn tractor. You could drive right down the row, slow, and harvest all that stuff automatically into a tractor. And you just turn around. Yep, you could be driving down the row, drinking a cold one, harvesting your fodder. Easy. That's right. Here's one that was mounted in the front. Like They make this stuff commercially. You can buy this off the shelf, have it drop shipped. Yeah, here's tree hay. This is really simple. I harvested about 150 pounds in like five minutes of wet fodder. Just brought it in the shade, laid it out, and it dried. Smells amazing. I took some up with me to Mark's and fed it to his pigs. That stuff hit the ground. They came over. They're a little bit scared of it. And then they smelled it, and they just started pounding it. It was crazy. They stripped every single leaf off of that in like a minute. It was gone. They love it. We confirm it. The stuff is silage. Again, we just chop it up. We ferment it. You can put it in five-gallon buckets. You can put it in 55-gallon drums. You can put it in bags. As long as you can keep it um, protected from oxygen, you can store it for several years. It takes about two to three months, depending on the temperature, to get it fermented enough that it's going to be basically shelf-stable. So imagine you got enough of this stuff that you can put away a year's worth of feed. This, you know, this stuff, the white mulberry... I didn't cover this. I don't know why I didn't cover this. White mulberry is between, like on the low end. At the end of the season, we're talking like 8% protein. Okay? We're shooting for between 12 and 16% protein with most of our livestock feeds. For poultry, we're shooting for like 16 to 26% on the high, high end. This mulberry, on the protein content in the spring can be as high with ideal conditions, almost 40% protein. That's crazy. Um, alfalfa is generally around 17% protein. So this is an alfalfa replacement that you can grow in all of the lower 48. That's a big stinking deal. All right, we can pelletize it. Again, sorry, it's hard to see. We got pellets of feed over here. And, you know, we might need a little bit of energy, a little bit of carbohydrates. We want fat animals. What do we give them? Carbs. Sugar puts fat on it. Basically all animals. Um, protein, we need it to build muscle. 
So if we want big, juicy, meaty animals, we give them a little bit of carbs too to make sure they can put on some fat. So, I mean, what we can do, even on a small scale, we can find a local producer that raises grain and we can get some grain direct from the producer by pulling up with the pickup truck with a, uh, a tarp in the back and say, hey, how much for a truck bed full of, full of that corn that's coming out of that combine? I don't know, 50 bucks? Sweet. You pull up, it drops the auger over, fills up the bed of your pickup, hand them a $50 bill, head on home, put this stuff in a bin, and we could put this a little bit of corn or wheat or barley. I mean, yeah, triticale, oats, um, buckwheat. Someone here was saying they, they can get buckwheat for like $50 a ton. Yeah. Yeah. Put some buckwheat in with the, the mulberry leaves and pelletize that. Man. Yeah. A little bit of biochar. That would be amazing. Oh, don't do the biochar. That's illegal. Yeah. All right. Um, I want to kind of pound this a little bit harder. I want to drive this home. If, if we rely, great. If we rely on outside systems to make what we are designing in our lives functional, we are designing a broken system. We can't sustain it because we cannot count on the world to always be working. We've got to take responsibility for our own lives. One of those ways, one of the biggest ways that I have seen in the decade I've been doing what I do is people design homesteads that are 100 freaking percent dependent on a big box store being getting, receiving loads of grain. That's already processed and packaged up. That means they're depending on the processors. That means they're depending on these big multi-thousand acre farms. That means those people are depending on the fertilizer and the pesticides and their big pieces of equipment, computers working, right? Everything is dependent upon that whole big long chain of production. So I'm not saying divorce yourself from that entirely tomorrow <laughs> don't hear me saying that i'm saying start moving in the direction that's going to get you to a point where you do not have to play their game where you get to keep all of that money that you were once sending out and we can snowball the wealth that we can control so i want to see you build resiliency and i want to see you divorce dependence on outside inputs. All right, every, another question I always get, where can I get these? Every winter, January 1st, I start taking orders for fodder trees and I package them up. You can find them elsewhere. If you're planting out hundreds and hundreds, I encourage you to find a wholesaler that'll ship them to you because I'm not at that level yet. Will be soon, not there yet. But if you wanna get started, these things are easy to propagate. These things are very easy to propagate. If you just get a handful of them grown on your property, one hybrid willow, if you take care of it, first year can give you about 20 trees. The second year can give you about 200 trees. The third year can probably give you about 500 to 1,000 trees, all right? It scales very rapidly with one tree. So all you need to do is get one of them growing. So if you want to order some, that's where I've got them. Do you have a sign up for notification there? Um, no, I don't. Oh, okay. You want to talk to me after yes. the Oh, workshop? yes. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Telegram. I have a Telegram group for Rare Plant Store. I send notifications there first. So if I have 
trees coming up a day or two early. Everyone on my Telegram group hears about it first. Um, I sell out every year. And people email me later saying, oh, I missed again. I missed it again. I've been trying to get trees for three years. What's your Telegram group? Um, T.me forward slash rare plant store. Yeah, thank you. I didn't know the T.me. Um, so yeah, uh, as I get some more rare plants, sometimes I'll have something kind of unique. I'll put a notification there, and it normally doesn't even go up on the website because it's it's just going instantly. Um, so yeah, now I want to open it up for questions. I know there There's were questions. Several. So to ask a question, line up behind that mic over there, and we will alternate alternate between that and digital. Please ask your question, and then if he needs background, you can supply the background. Nick, if you're doing a farm where you have sheep, how do you keep the sheep from getting to the coppice and plants because they're below the ground? Do you break it up or what? Fence. Electric fence or, or solid fence. Okay, question from Aaron. I have mostly wooded property. It's not good fodder. Is it worth it to change it to a fodder forest? If you need fodder and all you have are overstory trees that are doing nothing for you, then I would start to systematically, not wholesale all at once, but systematically start thinning it out, start taking out the trees that are the least healthy, the least uh, useful long-term for something like lumber. That's just good forestry management. Implement some good forestry management practices. Start thinning it all out. Take out the most least desirable species and the least desirable forms and then start putting in your fodder trees. It may be wise in your situation to take out a big old chunk and just clear cut a chunk so that you can get a quarter of an acre of fodder trees planted right away. And then you start thinning out and adding fodder trees in elsewhere because you can get one big chunk that you can coppice. And then you could start expanding out and building out an entire forest of silva pasture by just thinning trees and planting uh, fodder trees that you're going to pollard underneath uh, so that you can graze underneath it. Nick, um, sometimes I'm a little slow on the pickup of some things. Are you saying we should design our own lives and not let the world design it for us? Yes. Thank you. Okay, next one comes from K Bonk. K Bonk says, Can coppice trees be woven into a living wall? Absolutely. Um, uh, we can we can take these trees and and plant them in rows where we want to have a living fence, and then as they grow, we can start to coppice them. So we get a whole bunch of shoots from that stump. We let them grow there for a year or two, maybe three, and we keep coppicing them. We use those uh, first year cuttings to plant out more of our fence. We might make it a little bit wider. We might go with about a three foot wide, maybe three rows of trees, and we keep coppicing them. And then we start cutting hedges and laying them, and you can weave those together. If at the point where the branches contact, you expose the cambium on both points, they will graft together, and you can graft yourself a living um, uh, lattice fence that will be literally, I mean, you won't have a, a four inch hole through it. You can actually get a solid wall of wood. So silage seems like a good way to store, but, mm -hmm. you know, is there really a benefit over one versus the other? Yes. Um, so silage is going to retain its nutrient profile longer. It's also going to kind of, for lack of a better term, partially pre-digest the food. So we have higher digestibility um, and it is more uh, biologically active than a dry silage will be uh, a dry, you know, hay will be. So whenever we have stuff exposed to the elements like uh, UV light and oxygen, those leaves will be oxidizing. So a couple of years after you harvest it, those leaves will have oxidized and we will have lost a lot of the nutritive qualities in it. So if we can prevent that stuff from oxidizing by converting it into silage, we retain an incredibly large amount more 
nutrients than if we would have just cut it and hung it up to dry. So a question from Jerry online is, how soon after planting fodder trees can you begin to safely harvest from them? I assume he means by not killing the tree. Right. Um, it depends on your environmental conditions. So if, if you're in a harsh environment like Jack here, um, I would suggest waiting until those trees get at least at least rake handle, you know, broom handle, thick trunks at the base, if not like a shovel handle, a tool handle, axe handle, thickness base. Um, because if you're in a, a brittle, harsh environment, um, there's more that can go wrong. And I'd like to see that tree get a much more established root system before you start cutting it. If you're somewhere where you can get irrigation and fertilization to it and, and you're kind of babying it and you got some mulch down, and first year, I've got, you know, I've got nice uh, Sharpie sized or uh, a dry erase marker diameter uh, trunks at the very bottom. I mean, we're, we're cutting those to the ground first year. So we can start harvesting off of those the first year that they're in the ground. The drawback to that is you are reducing the next year's growth. So if you can hold off for one year and you get really good growth one whole year and then coppice them, you will actually put more energy down into the roots the, after, at the end of that first year. And because of that, you'll have a much stronger second year. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a give and take. So we can take a little bit more earlier at the cost of slower start and a less bounteous harvest the second year and third and fourth year. But you can do that the first year. If I have a tree that I've coppiced, now I want to introduce animals. Can I turn that into a pollard and vice versa? You can, um, but if you coppice it, you will have all of that, uh, that um, healed wounded wood at the base that is full of what are basically plant stem cells. They're meristematic cells. Um, Whenever you, you see kind of a, a, a pruned uh, or you see shoots coming up out of the bottom of a fruit tree, you're always going to be fighting it there. They're always going to be throwing up shoots because there's a whole bunch of those stem cells. So if we start coppicing it and we have that kind of gnarly looking thing at the base, it's always going to be throwing up shoots. Now, the animals will be harvesting it. So you could just kind of select one and just prune off the other shoots and get a good trunk started. You're probably always going to have some, some shoots popping up. But that might actually be a, an ancillary benefit um, to the I mean, browsing I animals. still get shoots in my pollarded trees yeah. that I put in. So Yeah. Okay, I have uh, Sean from Hack My Solar, who was too lazy to get off the front couch, <laughs> went on nice. the live stream and asked, <laughs> <laughs> can you make biochar from your cuttings? Oh, thank you so much. I'm, I, I meant to add that into my um, presentation. So... In, uh, in, in that whole process, you know, the, the whole uh, flow chart, we had mulch, right? At the end of the year, what are we doing? We're taking a whole bunch of relatively uniform pieces of wood and harvesting them. Is there something we can do with relatively uniform pieces of wood? <laughs> yeah. So we can take that. We can mulch it. We can dry that and put it through. Uh, a J2 rocket mass heater in a greenhouse and we can burn that for, for heat. We can take that stuff and dry it and then process it into biochar and we can take that biochar and put it in our chicken compost and then we can put that through a Johnson Sioux bioreactor and then a year later we put that on our garden and we keep building more fertility and resiliency. There is a point, guys, at which you will build so much fertility in your garden you will be required to stop inputting fertility because you'll make it toxic okay so if you keep doing this stuff you will actually get to a point where you will be forced you must export from your system because you're capturing so much solar energy and converting it into fertility that you will be required to take a profit that is what i call sustainable because it will, uh, it will absorb so much punishment, so many mistakes, because it is so resilient. So 
Can we make biochar out of it? Heck yeah. Okay, buddy, go for it. So this is really cool and totally I've started the process. But one of the things I want to do is I want to grow my own food with water trees. But I also want to make sure that I give a balanced diet to my animals. Mm -hmm. How can I make sure that I'm growing the right things to give a balanced diet across the whole thing? Grow more than one thing. You know, I, I, I love mulberry trees. I'm going to plant mostly mulberry trees. Um, I'm not taking my herbivores and putting them on a concrete floor and only feeding them the mulberry. They are getting a supplement to their grazing in the form of high protein mulberry with our, our poultry. You can only really, according to the research papers I've read, feed upper limit of 20% of their diet as mulberry leaves. So, you know, we're not feeding this as a, like a single food source diet. This is just, instead of going out and buying alfalfa pellets in bags, we are growing our own alfalfa pellets at home. So this is supplementary feed in the winter when they're eating lower quality hay and we need to keep that body condition high with, with some extra protein and, and sugars in the forms of those leaves. So, um, you know, we just, we plant a variety of fodder trees or we harvest what we have on our property. Like nine out of 10 trees that you've got on your property are suitable in some way, shape or form to feed your animals as, as fodder leaves. Yeah. So I put in fodder trees on my property about three years ago. Mm -hmm. And the complication based on the bundle of trees I got from you was that I had so many box elders that my animals love eating that I didn't want to remove because they were mature and producing a lot. Mm -hmm. I had to find places for them because it was already growing there. So it's, it's funny how, when you look around, you find things mm -hmm. and that's, that's sheep and goat crack, by the way. Oh okay, yeah. Last question. We got that one. Nick always love your systems, man. On, on, when you were doing the, the flow chart, I think you mentioned meat and bones going into your compost. Yep. A lot of people will tell you not to put fat or meat in there mm -hmm. because it'll attract other critters, critters you may not want. So could you speak about that? Sure. Um, so what I've done for years, um, when I have a successful chicken flock that foxes don't decimate, um, <laughs> that's happened multiple times. I hate foxes. Um, is I go with a deep litter system in my chicken. I call it my chicken barn. It's not a chicken coop. It's like a little little barn shed thing. And I've got a, a wood floor in it. And I will start with a good 12 inches of wood shavings. I use wood shavings from a uh, cabinet maker. So it's smaller than wood chips. It's bigger than sawdust. It's fluffier than sawdust. Um, and it's free. They use a vacuum system and they just vacuum all of it up whatever they put through a router. Yes, there's going to be some MDF powdery stuff in there. I don't sweat it. If I open it up and it's just nothing but MDF, well, I put it somewhere else. But I start with about 12 inches. Everything that can turn into dirt goes into a pan in there. The chickens pick through it. They can't eat the bones, so they just eat around the bones. All of that gets dumped into the bedding every day when I bring the new bucket. And then they scratch through it. And because I use lactobacillus spray in my bedding, it basically turns the whole thing into one big bakashi pit, right? And it pickles everything. And there's no smell. If any, if any mice and rats show up, the chickens eat them and the dogs eat the rats. So um, everything that can turn into dirt goes into that pan. The chickens eat what they can. I mean, they got some spoiled milk. They will drink the stuff. Um, everything goes in there and then it just gets dumped into the bedding. It gets dried it gets kind of mummified. And then we clean that out once a year and we compost it. And so all those bones turn into soil. All right. Let's give jazz hands for Nick. If you want to keep talking to him, he's totally going to walk out that garage door after he gets the mic off so that he can talk to you. Yep. We are going to start again in 15 minutes with Matt Powers.
Well, my buckle makes impressions on the inside of her thigh. There are little feathered Indians where we tussle through the night. If I'd known she was religious, then I wouldn't have came stoned to the house of such an angel who fucked up to get back. Looking over West Virginia, smoking spirits on the roof. She asked, ain't anybody told you that them things are bad for you? I said, many folks aboard me. There have been several people try, but up till now, there ain't been nothing that I couldn't leave behind. Oh, 